Hello everybody. Hopefully you can see and hear me. Um, hi, welcome to the Joy of Coding episode 4 where I'll be hacking on Firefox live. Um, I'm using a new uh, piece of streaming software called OBS to stream to you today. Hopefully that all works out. I'm also using it to record the stream on my machine so that we can upload it later to Air Mozilla when everything's all done. You might notice me flipping back and forth to check to make sure that that's going all right because we tried it as an experiment last week and it didn't record properly and we think we figured it out but we just need to make sure so periodically I'll I'll probably switch just to to check to make sure that the file size of the recording is still getting uh, larger as we go so uh, without further ado here is uh, my screen and we're going to go with this agenda so hopefully you can read this this is what I'm planning on doing today so First of all, my customary uh, preamble that no plan survives breakfast, none of this is planned. I don't exactly know how this is going to roll today. It's all kind of um, played by ear. I know what work I need to do, I just don't know how it's going to end up. Uh, think of it like an episode of Cops, where the cops know that they need to make a house call or something, but they don't exactly know what's going to happen, except that instead of dealing with potential criminals or disputes, I'm dealing with bugs. Uh, so that's OBS, uh, that's what I want to talk about there. Yay, I'm glad to hear that the text is crystal clear. Raphael says the text is crystal clear. That's great. And hopefully the audio is crystal clear as well. Hopefully you can hear uh, So, a quick update. Uh, I don't know if you were watching the last stream, but in episode three, uh, at the very end in the last quarter, I found out that I had caused a regression in uh, printing so that uh, every time you did a print job, we failed to save the print settings from print job to print job. And uh, we filed that yeah. bug, and that was kind of like, I don't want to say I left you on a cliffhanger, but I didn't address that bug uh, after I'd filed it at the end of last week's stream. And uh, I wanted to give you a quick update on it. I was able to fix the bug. I cross-landed it across Central Aurora Beta and also release because I believe we're spinning a point release for 36. So uh, that should be fixed in the upcoming 36 point release, and if you're riding uh, a Mozilla or Firefox beta or uh, developer edition or nightly that should be fixed uh, right now I believe I, I think that's true it's possible that you might need to wait a couple of days for the for the next beta to be spun out to have the fix on beta but regardless the fix has landed everywhere so pretty happy about that um, so where am I now uh, we've been working the past couple of weeks on printing on Linux and uh, that's, there's no exception, I'm going to be doing the same thing today, but we've actually we've moved forward quite a bit since the last time we were here. Uh, let me tell you what's been going on. So that regression that we found last week, um, that actually, I didn't just fix it, but I realized that the, um, the way to fix it involves kind of changing some of the underlying assumptions that some of my Linux uh, printing patches have made. So I kind of had to go back and change a few things. Particularly, um, one thing that we've been doing is instantiating print settings in the parent process, passing them down to the child process. The child process then passes them up again, serializes and deserializes them to the parent process, uh, which shows them in the print settings dialog. And then when the print settings dialog closes, they're sent back down to the child process where the print job actually executes. And then uh, my patch for 1136855 here, uh, what we do to actually save the print settings is we send a final message, we do all this ping pong and we send this final message back to the parent saying our print job is done, here are the print settings and the parent process writes the print settings to the preferences uh, preferences database, or sorry, the preferences uh, hash table. So it's a lot of ping ponging, it's not great, but that's kind of the way it works. And we have to save it in the parent process because the content process does not have the ability to save prefs. Uh, you can't set a pref in the content process. Uh, we prevent that. We actively prevent that. So you have to send anything you want to save to prefs. You have to send it up to the parent process to have it saved. So that's um, we we send a print setting because they're in the print settings are instantiated in the parent process and dealt with in the content process. Um, we end up having we like create this kapow thing. Cross uh, kapow stands for cross process object wrapper. And we're able to sort of deal with that in the single process case, because all this same code will run in the single process and multi-process case. It's not a compound in the single process case, and we're able to like 
see those print settings properly, and then send them back up to the parent and write them to the preferences uh, preferences hash table without a problem. It's a little hairier with the uh, multi-process case in receiving print settings from the parent process because it's a compile whenever they're sent down from the parent process. It's a cross-process object wrapper. It's an object that's been sent from the parent. We weren't able to serialize it through JavaScript and the mechanism that we send it down from the parent. So we have this like this proxy to the object in the parent uh, called a compile, which if you're interested in compiles, because they're, they're kind of fascinating, my blog, um, you know, let me write you a link here at mikeconley.ca. I have a blog post there, a couple of, you have to go down a few, but I talk about compiles and how they work. Um, if you're interested in that, check that out. But basically, when we have a compile from the parent, we can't pass it to native code. And all of the print stuff is native. So my solution to that, in order to not reopen this bug that we had discovered last week, my thinking is that we should instantiate the printing settings in the content process. Uh, and then uh, that kind of saves us from having to, oh no, the audio is apparently cutting in and out. That's not good. Um, oh no. Let's, let me just quickly check. Apparently I'm not dropping any frames. My CPU usage is at 20%. Um, well, hopefully, hopefully it gets better. I'm not entirely sure what I can do. Um, okay, well, it, it's not dropping. <laughs> so there, it's not cutting out for some people. It might depend perhaps on your connection speed. In the, in the event that you're watching this on the stream and things are cutting in and out, it's possible that you might actually be better off watching the recording afterwards. I'm not entirely sure. We'll see how it works. But I'm sorry if this isn't kind of working out for some folks. Um, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants. Anyway, I'm doing a lot of talking. I'd really like to get working. So uh, basically the idea is we want to instantiate the print settings in the content process. Then... Um, all of the serialization, deserialization work we do for the, the dialogue, that all can still, can still work without uh, an issue. But then when we save the print settings, we'll do that. We'll, we'll call the method to save the print settings in the content process, but then we will proxy that method so that it, it actually uh, sends the serialized print settings up to the parent to actually save to the, the print settings hash table. It's all kind of convoluted. But uh, we need this. We need this in order to not reopen the same bug from last week, and we need it because we need to instantiate the content. Uh, sorry, the print settings in the content process for Linux printing. So we need this. Uh, this is the bug. If you're following along in the video, uh, I have a whole list of bug numbers and notes links in the uh, comment below this video. So check those out if you want to follow along. The good news is this is actually I, I've been working on this uh, this week. And it's pretty much good to go. Um, that's you know, these are this is my patch uh, stack here. Uh, this is Mercurial graph log. This is the head of inbound as of this morning. And these are the four uh, patches or change sets or whatever you want to call it on top of inbound that deal with uh, instantiating the content, uh, the settings, print settings in the content process. And they're ready to go. I've got review from. Uh, Mossip on two of them and Smog on the other two, uh, and they're pretty much ready to land. I did want to make sure that I had addressed all the review feedback first, give it a final uh, sort of smoke test, and then I was going to land it on inbound. So we're actually going to land a thing. Um, we're going we're gonna to land a thing today, assuming the tree is open, because sometimes the tree is closed. I should actually check and make sure that the tree is open. Uh, and as luck would have it, the tree is closed. But maybe by the time I'm done, uh, maybe by the time I'm done testing all of this stuff and making sure it's all working, maybe the tree will be open. And if not, well, that's okay. We can work on something else, and I'll land this stuff when the tree has opened up. So, uh, right, I wanted to make sure that all the review issues have been addressed. So let's take a look at the reviews that were on this patch. Set of patches, I should say. Change set. Change sets? Something. The changes. Okay, so here are the changes. Let's take a look at the reviews I was given on all four of these. 
make sure I addressed all of them. I just got, uh, that didn't have any issues opened on it. So this is actually, um, I screwed up last week and accidentally pushed um, this set of commits, like I accidentally put um, the bunch of commits for a different bug uh, into this bug. So I've got some fragments in here, like some testing, um, some review fragments from a completely unrelated bug. That was my fault. So we're gonna ignore the, these review comments from Carl. Um, they are valid review comments for the other bug, but not for the one that we're, we're talking about right here. So this one just got a straight up ship it from, from Mossip, so uh, we can ignore this one. Uh, let's see. Same here. Uh, this one? So this one uh, doesn't have an R plus here because there was a problem with Moz review a couple of days ago, uh, which we resolved, but so this this is kind of a, a gong show, this entire review request. Some of it's intermingled with um, comments from another bug, and at one point Mazu just flat out stopped working, so there are some there's some information that's kind of lost, but I was given R plus on that particular patch over here, using the sort of old school attachment reviewing mechanism, so I did get an R plus from, um, from Smog here. So that one is good to go. This one is an R minus. Uh, on the same day, I also put up that the fourth patch in the series up on Bugzilla, and that was R minus. But then I up review board got Moz review got fixed up, and so I put an updated version up on Moz review, which then got a I believe a ship it right. Did I get a ship it? So this is good. Uh, maybe I don't have a ship it on this, in which case I need to make sure that I've got it. I'm certain I got a ship it on this. So where did that ship it go? This is not super typical. Unfortunately, uh, a bunch of stuff got in the way of me doing this, re getting this review done properly. He minus it, and then, and then he R plus it here. Ah, so he, I think he manually R plus something. U R plus attachment eight five six zero six four two, which is that, which I then updated which got rid of the review plus flag. So he did R plus it. Whew. Okay. So I do have R pluses across them all. Uh, and then this last piece of feedback, this is why I check this stuff. Like, I'm not, um, I'm not just paranoid. It's because I kind of screwed up this entire uh, review process here, and I need to make sure that I addressed everything before I land. So... If you want me to use Mozilla coding style for the arguments in the .h file, which I believe I ended up doing, I can take a look at the last changes I made to this file. Revisions 7 and 8, yeah, I changed the arguments here to use the Mozilla style of the prefix A. You'll notice that it's not being used for some of the other methods. Some inconsistency there, but um, I'm not too worried about that. He just wanted me to use the style. Whatever. So I think I am actually good to go to land this uh, once the tree re reopens, but it's not open right now. Um, so let's move on to something else. Okay. So let's take a look at my other patches. I actually attempted to write some tests for, uh, like all this printing stuff, it's unfortunate that it's not designed nicely for testing. So I thought, well, maybe I can I, maybe I can investigate. Maybe it is actually possible to test this stuff in an automated way, and I don't have to do this manually every time this manual testing blows. And I started to write a regression test for this um, print settings not being saved from job to job, but I hit a roadblock where I'm not actually able to mock out the part of the 
um, printing engine that actually does the printing uh, without writing it in native code. I could, I'd have to write it in C++ or something. I couldn't mock it out with JavaScript, which kind of put a, a, a roadblock up. So I do want to come back to this. I really would like to make it possible to write some regression tests for the printing stuff, um, but I'll come back to it later. So this is the stuff I'm working on now. It's actually the same stuff I was working on last week, which was making um, printing work in Linux. Uh, oh, I should also mention that I've reordered these patches somewhat. Um, I also have this patch here that we were working on a couple of episodes earlier, um, where I was making it so that the calls from the child to the parent to show progress and show the print dialog uh, should not be synchronous calls, but should be asynchronous calls. And I've got a patch to do that, and originally I'd put it on top of, put it at the very top here, I'd put it after all of this Linux work, but I sort of rearranged things because I have a feeling this is closer and is more likely to land sooner. So I can um, base my Linux stuff on top of it. Um, but I actually, you know, now that I think of it, I think there are a couple of issues to still address in it. In particular, I don't think that I, while showing the print dialog is now asynchronous, I have a feeling showing progress is not, but I need to, to double check that. Um, but I don't think I want to do that today. But I will take a note to do that. Maybe I'll do that after. Check. Uh, I'm going to say see if show print progress. Yeah, show progress should be async to and how that worked. Okay, always write it down. So, what have we done? I've done this, this, and this. So, strike three. So, uh, where am I now? I'm going to update my tree to point to the this Carl T changes change set because this is um, sorry, not the Carl T changes change set. The uh, tip here where I enable printing on uh, Linux because what I noticed, and maybe I'd screw this up, maybe I'm wrong, but what I noticed is that after I had applied some of these changes, I couldn't print properly on Linux. Like I, I'd attempt to print a document in ETNS and then nothing would end up coming out of my, uh, my printer. My fake printer, actually. I'm using a, a PDF printer. And so something, I believe something that I've done in this, to address Carl T's feedback has broken things and I want to find out what that is. So I'm going to, this shouldn't take too long. Um, it's just a couple of files to change. While we're waiting on that, I'm just going to check the IRC channel and make sure everything is still okay. Uh, yeah, no one's complaining about dropped audio. And, uh, hopefully you can still hear me and it's not too choppy. Okay, so then what am I going to do? What else am I going to do? Uh, while we're waiting for that to build, where am I in Carl T's feedback? That, like, what do I still need to do? Um, Let's check that out. So that's under here. Uh, I have that giant checklist of things to fix that Carl T had brought up. I think. Where was it? Yeah, here. Let's have some things. Notification just keep them job out of you know, I've done that. Okay. So I have all of this feedback now that I have to address as well. So we will get through that. And still building, but shouldn't take too too long. I'm just a couple of files to build. Okay, so what what are the things he wants me to fix? To review. Uh, he wants me to rearrange some things so that there are certain um, functions and methods that I've exposed. They should be private or protected. Uh, probably private, he says, and I agree. We want to, I had added this accepts PDF uh, bool to this print data struct that we don't actually need because um, NSI print settings already has an output format uh, property that I can use instead. So I don't have to worry about that. Move the printer enumerator into a runnable. 
right. And then, so that's not so bad. Replace all that stuff. Okay, yeah, I just, I overloaded, um, I'd used NS, I'd created this member inside NS device contact spec GTK for print settings and print settings GTK, and he says I can just use print settings GTK, because one is a superset of the other, so I don't need both. And some stuff in here, string munging, possible rename of something, and then I had already looked at the rest of DW Dev's feedback, and... Um, the the regression that we found last week was the most important bit. The rest of it, I filed follow-up bugs for the stuff he brought up that I don't think we need to address uh, in this patch. So we're we'll done there. And then there's some less important stuff down here, um, more just my own personal investigation. So this is what we're going to do once this is done building. Oh, build error. What happened? So let's. We have a problem. What's going on? Fallon says that audio or streaming is smooth and no audio dropouts. That's great. That's great news. So I have a building error. I think I got the signature wrong on one of my. Oh, you know what? Um, let me. What was it? Actually, over here. And printing. I have to see. Printing. And dot h. I am missing some stuff. I think. had some code that is definitely not here. Um, it's possible that it got lost during a screwed up rebase that I did earlier, but let me just, uh, let me tell you what I'm talking about. It's this should not be sync stuff. I should definitely have, uh, here, what do I have? put up just a normal bug. So I'm kind of doing this um, hybrid approach to putting up review requests where sometimes I use Moz review, sometimes I don't, just so I can, I don't get fully immersed in one or the other. And that way I can, I'm kind of in the middle and I can fairly evaluate both is my, is the way I feel about it. Anyways. So I'm actually, I was missing this, uh, missing something. The struct prompt result, missing this information. I think I lost it because I renamed NS Printing Prompt Service Proxy to NS Printing Proxy. And I lost that information. Uh, like I think I did a poor rebase whenever I reordered things um, to put the uh, uh, this async work down at the bottom of the stack. I, I kind of screwed it up. So. To, how do I want to solve that? There's not a great way, unfortunately. Like, I might just have to kind of like read this patch. Oh, this is the worst. I might have to read this patch and remember what I did and just reapply it. The, the changes would be in, like, the ones to worry about would be in the NS Printing Prompt Service Proxy and the associated header because. Um, everything else should apply normally. Let's make sure. Oh boy, this is the worst. So let's make sure we've got this stuff. So pprinting IPDL. Sorry about that. I... Yeah, it's async. Async. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Parent. Should have this new method called show print dialog. Yeah. yeah, that's right. 
And then receive show print dialog should call it, which it does. Great. That looks right. And then the header I should have. Uh, was it yeah, receive show print dialog should take ID parenting its settings. Yep. And then in private show print dialog. Yep, that's all good. So it's just the stuff in here, which if I remember correctly, isn't too bad. I just have to what was the main difference? This you know what I actually might be better off looking at an earlier version. Um, let's see. Is the procedure like yeah, the uh, this diff is more accurate. This was before the sort of reordering of things, and I don't think I had changed my technique at all. Yeah, so I think this will, I can use this information to reapply my work. This is, so you're about to see, this is rather embarrassing. I'm going to be hand reapplying this work. Um, that's probably the shortest path to just moving forward. Um, it's pretty embarrassing, but it's the joy of coding. That's what you get. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, this is in the method show print dialog, which is up here. I'm going to be removing. What am I doing? What does I need to do? You know what? I also need to make sure I'm at the right uh, point in the. I have to check out the patch that I'm correct. 507. So I have to get into the right tree state. Good. Make sure everything is synced up. Okay. And then on line 67, it's here, where I had originally been, I had this like, cool success. Not found. Not found. What's going on here? What's going on? You're watching. Uh, you're watching a man flip. Hold on. Um, modified settings and the serialized print data. This is just above receive print dialog results, which is not in here because I'm in the wrong file. Oh, oh boy, I am in the wrong file. Uh, I should be an NS printing proxy. CPP. That was embarrassing. I well, at least it was a simple explanation. I was starting to go. Uh, I was starting to question reality there. Okay, this makes more sense. Um, you know, what did I want to change? Oh, no, this stuff's in here properly. This stuff's totally in here. Move, and then this receive print dialog result, and it's using a linked list. So then, maybe I've made that the same mistake earlier. Yeah, here's the struct that I need. Hey, I have everything I need. So maybe I was wrong. I made a bad assumption, and maybe the build problem is not. Uh, well. Let's see if this builds. And then maybe I should read that uh, error message a little closer. I probably misinterpreted it. And uh, we need to find out why I'm not building. Pain in the butt. Okay, and while we're waiting for that, let's see. What can we do while we're waiting for that? We'd already kind of reviewed Carlton's feedback. Um, well, I guess we can go over this patch to see how, like, we can check this stuff out now while we're waiting for this. So, one thing that's already asynchronous is the showing the print dialog. Like, we 
we spin a nested event loop in the child and we wait for the result from the parent and then the parent sends the result back and then we return it to our caller in the, in the child. And that's for the print settings dialog, but what about the progress dialog, which is currently sync. Probably shouldn't be. Arguably shouldn't be. Um, see, the thing about the show progress dialog, though, is... Oh, hold up. Why would we want this to not be seen? Because I don't think... Like, while it's open, I don't think we block. I think we only block in the content process waiting for the window to open, which isn't so bad. And then what we end up getting back is this um, print progress listener, sorry, this web progress listener and the print progress listener and this dialogue child that we send messages through to update the state of the, like to, to basically show the progress occurring in the parent process uh, even though it's occurring in the, in the child process. So I have a feeling this doesn't actually need to be async. Let's take a look at the bug to make sure. I'll make sure I'm not misinterpreting. Ah, oh, still, okay, so backtrack. I've been killing time waiting for us to get here, or uh, killing time waiting for us to build, and we still have a build problem. So something is still up, but that's good. Um, I'm, I get to see this error message, and we're going to solve it. It sounds like the signature is wrong on this method. Error, error. It says, cannot be overloaded. Receive, save, print settings cannot be overloaded. So let's take a look at our definition of receive. What is it? Receive, save, print settings cannot be overloaded. Is it possible that I accidentally included that twice? I'd be in printing parent, I think. Yeah, I've got it twice. That's the problem. I have a feeling during my rebase, I accidentally included this twice. So I will get rid of that. I think that'll let me build now. Um, let's try it. I want to make sure that 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 actual addition occurs in this patch and not in the patches that I was originally going to push to inbound. That would have been super embarrassing if I pushed that to inbound and it just didn't build. Um, if you're going to push something to inbound, if you're going to push something to, to central or inbound or any of the integration branches or something, you're going to want to make sure it builds. It's embarrassing if it doesn't build. Um, anyways, where was I before I context switched? Let's go to this bug where we talk about making the stuff async. Let's see what the rationale is for making the progress dialog async. I wrote this. Uh, when the print settings dialog is open, the Windows mode will spin some event which feeds the echo main loop. Introduce some echoes on the styles from the main process of our IPC. Those IPC calls are singing us from the child. So the child is blocked while the user works with the print settings dialog. For example, this is no good, especially since we've only got a single content process. Consider if the user has multiple windows open and open the print settings dialog in one. We should run our own event loop for as long as the print settings dialog is open, as this is what platform already does in the non eternal case. Smog writes, click and create a print dialog program and, and delete continue while you're waiting to delete. Yeah, that was one way of doing it. Maybe this is the better, in review, maybe this will be the better solution. I ended up doing this thing where I've got, um, how it works is, uh, same here. I create this thing called a prompt result, and I give it an ID. There's this like list of IDs in the, or this integer that I keep track of in the proxy that grows every time you attempt to open up the print settings dialog. I attach the ID under this prompt result, I send the message to the parent asynchronously, and then I insert that prompt result into this linked list and spin the event loop. 
Uh, while I'm spinning the event loop, it's possible that I will receive a message from the parent to, like with the results of the uh, print settings dialog, that occurs down here, in which case I find the proper prompt result entry with the ID, because I send the ID up to the parent, and the parent will echo it back to me. So I find the right prompt result with that ID and update it with the return value and the print data, which I can then deserialize. Once that uh, happens, I also set this return true boolean, which allows the nested event loop to exit. Then the prompt result is removed from the linked list and, and Bob's your uncle. The reason I use a linked list is it's possible to have multiple windows open up printing dialogs uh, one after the other. So you could have, say, five windows open, and then you could open up a print dialog in each one, one right after the other. But you don't have to... Um, on Linux, I'm pretty sure that it's... I think Carlos T said it was like first in, first out. So um, you have to uh, close them in the same order that you open them. I believe that's how it works. Whereas on Windows, I believe you can just close them in any old, you can like fire off those print dialogs in any old order. And I'm, that's what I'm trying to account for here with the uh, prompt result linked list to make sure that the results from one dialog aren't accidentally interpreted as being, um, as being the results for a different dialog. Uh, while like we have this nested event loop spinning um, I'm pretty sure that will, I'm pretty sure it works. Like I tested it and it seemed to work, at least with my, uh, my PDF printer. But maybe I'm wrong. All this nested event loop stuff is kind of foreign to me. This is, the, this is my first time writing a nested event loop and you really don't want to do those. Um, that's, that's the sort of lesson I've been learning here is nested event loops are the devil. You don't want those. Uh, they confuse everybody. So building worked. That's great. So I'm going to actually, uh, before I commit this to this patch, I want to know where the addition of that extra call, that extra definition in that header came from. Yeah, okay. I It was in this patch. See, save print settings. Yeah. So there's two. There's one here, and then there's one here. So I'm just removing this one now. So we're all good. I'm going to commit this. Commit and amend. Mercurial takes its time. And now I've got all these unstable change sets, which I will evolve on top of the stuff I just changed. Man, that looks intimidating. But don't worry about it, because evolve takes care of it. This is basically rebasing all of the stuff that was dependent on the change that I just changed on top of the new change set. So it's doing that now. And then I will go back to the tip. We will get back to what we were doing before. Finally, we will build. Hopefully, it will build properly. And then we can find out why I broke printing with that feedback from Carl T. That's the plan. Um, it's taking its time. Is there anything? Okay, I. That's almost done. I think I can just wait a second for this. One second, it says. It's lying. That's, it's going to take longer than one second. It will take literally 10 more seconds. Alright, there we go. Great. And now I should be at the tip. Once I evolved, I am. So now let's let's build this. And we will keep working. And I should also update the actually before I um, before I build let me no, I'm not this one. Right, five seven five one six. That's this one. Should not be synced. Let's update the patch so that we don't have that confusion again. So I'm using BZ export here because it's just a single change for this bug. I, that seems to be the differentiator for me. If it's just a single patch change and I get this massive 
stack, but that's okay because uh, BZ export is crazy, but um, still worked, still attached it. But that seems to be the dif differentiator for me um, in terms of whether or not I use Moz review or um, standard Bugzilla attachments. If I'm I'm finding that I'm doing a lot of work where I have multiple change sets, and that's great. I think I I actually prefer doing that. But if it's only just a single change set, I'll just use Bugzilla attachment. And that way, I've got kind of my foot in both camps. Um, so I'm going to build tip now, and then let's quickly make sure that this makes sense. The patch I just uploaded. What? No. What? Why is this NS printing prompt service proxy in here? That's not. That shouldn't be in there. No, that's all wrong. This 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 information should not be here. Something's gone wrong. Bail out. I have a feeling that, like again, I think I screwed up a rebase at one point. Seven five one six. What's in? What's in here? Um, oh, it's printing. Let's see. It's printing prompt service proxy. It should not be there. It should not be there. Printing prompt service proxy dot star should not be there. That's fine. The dot orange file, I do not care. And now we will amend that. And then we'll also do that um, evolving file. This is my first time doing that, commit and then evolve all in one command, but it seems to have worked out. Alright. Meanwhile, uh, I've come to the conclusion, I think, that it's probably fine in this patch that I don't make the call for opening the progress dialog asynchronous. I don't think that adds much value. It's not that we're waiting for it to close, we're just waiting for the window to have been opened. That's all the content process is waiting for. And we do something similar for when we open up um, new pop-up windows from the content process. We block the content process, essentially, um, a little bit, waiting for that information from the parent. So, uh, I think that's not so bad. I'm actually thinking that this might be ready for review maybe today. Uh, it's possible Smog doesn't like my approach. I'll have Smog uh, review it, and that's fine. Uh, maybe he wants me to go with that. Instead of using the print data struct, we'll use the, uh, the delete method he suggested earlier on the bug. We shall see. So, actually, now that I've done that, I want to do that BZ export again. Got the result that we want. I think. Let's hope. Those massive additions should now be gone. Yes. Yes. Okay. Back to sanity. So we update to tip, and now I will build off of tip. Great. That's doing that. Um, let me just write down my conclusion here. I'm pretty sure we don't need to... Actually, that, this is the agenda. This is not where I want to write this. I want to write it in my note for the bug. I don't think... 
we need to make opening the print progress dialog async We're not block on user input or anything waiting um, in order uh, we're not blocking user input or anything. I shouldn't say anything. We're not blocking user input. We're blocked on the uh, opening of the window itself. We're not blocked on user input or the lifetime of the window. Of the window itself. Uh, it's possible that we want to spin an event loop. in the child for this that small pocket of time. But I really don't think it's a big deal at this point. Maybe we can even deal with it in a follow-up. Depends. Maybe if we get this first patch reviewed, we'll have some kind of generalized solution that I can use for the print progress dialog. Maybe. If it's that if it's deemed important enough, but I, I really don't think it's that important. Okay. So I can now check this off. Don't need to do that anymore. Now we're here and I'm waiting on this to finish building. That shouldn't take too long. If we get through this, then I also want I have this patch I need to review, a couple of patches I need to review from a contributor who's been working on um, reducing the number of unsafe kapows we use uh, in some of our context menus, like the, um, in, what, what is this for? Uh, open link, like open link in new tab, open link in new window, open link in new private window, et cetera. Those use unsafe kapows, and he's got some, uh, some patches in order to fix that, including, and, and a patch to fix tests for it. So I might review those today with you. But we are linking right now, so maybe we can just hold on a second and continue dealing with this printing stuff. I also take recommendations. If like, if I'm doing something in the stream that you want to see more of, or if there's stuff you want to see less of, etc., I'm totally open for feedback. Just drop a note in the IRC channel or send me a tweet. Uh, I'm Mike, I think Mike underscore Conley. There, there's my Twitter page. You can contact me here at Mike underscore Conley. Here, Mike underscore Conley. Hey, Firefox OS won the FXO won the Best of Mobile World Congress 2015. That's awesome. Okay. But yeah, drop me a line if, if you have any suggestions on things you want me to do. You can also email me. I'm mconley at mozilla.com. Almost done. Oh, I should probably check to see whether or not the stream recording is getting bigger. It says zero bytes. That's kind of... It's kind of uh, concerning, but it's possible that It'll only ever get written out to whenever I stop recording. Huh. I could stop recording and then start recording again, and then we'll just concatenate the two videos together. Maybe I'll do that for safety's sake. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep streaming, then I'm gonna stop recording and then start recording really quick. And that way um, Actually, I'd really like to see what the review process is like. Hope I still get those look at those patches today. Okay, well maybe I'll do that. Okay, I'll try and squeeze that in. Um, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stop recording and start recording real quick. A stop and a start of the recording. So I've got like a 1.16 gig file here. Hopefully we can sew these two together. Um, I don't really know if this is all of everything I've done, but hopefully it is. Hopefully we've got the information we need. Anyway, let's get back to work. Um, let's figure out, well, first of all, is there a problem? So let me describe what the problem was. I had applied Carlton's feedback, and then I tested his, like, I tested the patch to see if um, 
I could still print. And whenever I kicked off a print job, normally I've got this like PDF printer thing that my uh, VM knows about, and it, it prints out to this uh, as PDFs to this folder in my host machine. And so I, I had expected to see something show up here, and it didn't. So let's see if that's the case. And if it doesn't show up there, it means that the print job's not working. So let's try printing. I mean, e test tab, PDF writer, that's the PDF printer. I'm going to print in landscape, sure. Sounds good. This all sounds good. So I print, I get the dialog. Don't see any error messages. And does something show up here? It usually takes a couple of seconds, but then it shows up here. Nada. No, it would have shown up by now, so that's the problem. So, uh, what time is it? I started at 1. I'm going to carry on for another 40 minutes. I know Raphael wants to see me review those patches, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend 20 minutes trying to figure out why we're not printing here, and then write up my analysis of the problem and then I'm going to review those patches and, uh, and give those a shot. So, actually what I can do in the meantime in order to get a head start on myself is I will apply the patches that I'm going to review because I want to test them, make sure they work properly, uh, and I will build in my host machine. So let me apply these. Oh, wait, hold on. I don't want to import here. Don't do it. Reason? No, I want to bail out. Because I've actually got oh, the Aurora tip checked out. Because I landed something on Aurora today. So I want to check out Central. Well, that's doing that. Oh boy. Seriously, it's going to take that long? Alright. Well, over here. Let's see if we can figure out why we're not printing. Uh, so the child process is 11623, that's the process ID. I've already forgotten, it was 11623, so we'll attach. demanding so much from my machine right now. Pull yourself together, man. Great. Okay, so I'm on the tip of central, I believe. So I'm actually, I'm going to pull central and update to the tippet. Then I'm going to apply the patches from uh, Maz Ian. Maz Ian. Great. Um, so, apply the patches, build, and then work on, while it's building in my host machine, we'll figure out the printing in the guest VM. Apply all the patches. Ugh. Don't apply cleanly. Ugh. Why not? Why not? Seriously? Why don't you apply cleanly? I really want to test these out. That's a base content, content, just objective. I have a feeling it's just codes out of date. It's been bit rotted. I waited too long to review it. Lowest, sorry, man. Oh, you know what? I think he bases this off of some other work. Maybe that's my problem. It's not made. 
very close to standing, so you can do this on top of it. Think. No, it's just busted. I thought maybe I had to apply something else. Oh, depends on the work. Here we go. The equivalent frame commands. So I need to. Okay, I fully don't understand how this is supposed to apply right now. There's no patches here. Dependency loop, circular dependency. Ah, something is wrong with the structure of these bugs. Okay, so given the amount of time I have, how do I want to roll? If I'm going to review a thing, I need to be able to test a thing. And I can't test a thing if I can't apply a thing. So. I'm going to do. Hand apply it. I could definitely review this patch. That just changes tests. It's this one that won't apply properly. Why won't it apply? Oh, you know what? He merged the thing that apparently it was dependent on into this patch. This stuff was in the first patch. So that's why he closed out the other one. He merged it in. So that's what there is content content js. There is no G context menu content data here. What? So if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm trying to figure out where the heck, uh, yeah, it's there. Browser-based content, content.js. Yeah, yeah. It's content, content.js. Where is this stuff? Sanity check. It's at the bottom of this. Click event handle. And there's this like all this other stuff down here that's missing. Okay. Have there been changes here recently? It's going on. Chaos. HG blank no uh, log. I wonder if there's just been, this is October 25th, that's, okay, I'm confused, um, Mozilla Central, am I on the right, all right, sanity check, am I on the right branch, um, heads. What is at the head of Mozilla Central? Head of Mozilla Central is this change set. What change set am I at? 169. Okay, so I'm not at the right head. So I'm going to check out the head. I don't know where I was just now. That's why the patch didn't apply. I was definitely in the wrong place. Whew. And probably that's why it took so long to check out. I was, I'll bet you I was in like, 
some crazy old branch somehow. A central bookmark. What even is? Is this even going to work? All right. Well, while head, while mercurial in my host machine is sorting itself out, let's figure out printing down here. Why am I not printing? So, the place that I would like to check is where printing actually gets kicked off. Like the actual communication with the operating system printing backend gets kicked off, and that's not under embedding, what I'm doing. it's under rigid GTK NS device context spec G. Uh, and then here, we do that thing where we, we were working on this a couple episodes ago where we like iterate, we enumerate the printers, we find the printer that we want to print to in the content process, and then we start the print job. So actually, let's make sure uh, that we can still print in the single process case. Um, that's actually a good smoke test. Make sure that uh, I'm not completely off my rocker. I haven't broken the world here. Let's just do a simple print job print the page in a single process case. That should work. None of the stuff that I've touched with my feedback from Carlty should affect, as far as I understand, it should change the behavior of the single process case. So, landscape, yeah, that's fine. Print. Oh, there it is. Yes, here it is. So it showed. Up. So that's what we want. That was what we expected. Um, and no, don't open preview. I have no idea what's in there. Uh, so I'm gonna shut that down. And good. The single process case works. It's just the multi-process case that is not behaving as expected. So where I'd like to set a breakpoint is couple of places. End document is important. Uh, the part where we enumerate the printers is also important. Um, and then the start print job place is important. So let's do those three places. Break NS device context spec. GTK is it all caps? GTK, yep. Yeah. End document. We're gonna break uh, at the start print job and printer enumerator. Okay. Good, good, good. So let us print. PDF writer, everything looks dandy. Go. Great. Okay. Hit our breakpoint and end document. Do we, uh, are we printing to a printer? That should be true. Yeah. We shouldn't be able to find a GTK printer because we're in the content process. This should be no, yeah. So then we should skip over to enumerating the printers, right? So here we are, we're enumerating the printers. We get the spec. We get the name of the printer. Oh, interesting. Printer name is empty. That could explain it. Um, hmm. Zero, yeah, okay, so that's the problem. Um, for some reason, the printer name isn't being serialized properly. Down to the content process. Okay. So somehow we screw that up. Good. Solve that mystery. Let's write that down. So currently, uh, down at the bottom, all this stuff. Why isn't 
the printer name getting sent down to the content process properly? Great question. Great question. There are two ends to check. There's the parent process where we serialize the value, and then there's the child process where we deserialize the value. Uh, I'm going to keep this. Um, I'm just going to exit. I don't. Oh, good. I'm going to enumerate every printer here. I? If I disable, I don't care. And we probably never complete the print job because we never find the printer, and we error out silently because because I'm a fool. All right. So what I'm going to do is open up another GDB. This one will attached to the parent process. And that's what, one, one, four, and six. Now that's attaching. Quick context switch. We're able to check out the right. Um, we're able to check out the right branch that we wanted. Um, we are now at the tip of Mozilla Central. Now I'm going to try and apply Ian's patch again. Okay, that's slightly better. I can deal with a little tiny bit rot there. I can totally deal with this. All right, so browser. Where are we? Context menu. Where is that? That's here. And we're missing that. I'll bet G browser or uh, tab browser changed and so it bit rotted. It's not so bad. Put that in there. And that stuff down here. We call this up here and that. Down there, family. That's just a Ninja Turtles reference for you people. It's a great film. Okay, there we go. That looks good. Yeah, I didn't actually. Okay, yeah, that was good. Good, 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 good. So we've applied as patches. I think we only applied one of them. We need to apply the test as well, the test fix. Because we have two patches. Uh, Moz in, that is a bug. This test fix that I will kick off the build, and now we will, and then we'll go back into Linux, and we will figure out what the dealio is. Yeah, import this bug number. If he's using Moz review, I could just pull down the review branch on the review repo. So just apply that one patch, just the test fix. Bob's your own. Let's take a look. That looks right. Let's build it. All right. So meanwhile, back down here in the Linux VM. Uh, I'm going to keep those breakpoints where they were. I'm going to add a new one. Uh, Break when we deserialize the information from the parent. So, MS print options GTK um, deserialize print settings, print data to settings, I think is what it's called. Oh, got that wrong. Deserialize to print settings. Then in the parent, I'm going to break. Uh, where do I want to break? In 
the exact same thing, place, I think. That's print. Uh, what is it? Print options. GTK. Serialize to print data. I think that's what we want. Okay. That's still building. Great. So, multi process print PDF writer. This is the printer that we're choosing. That's the string that we're supposed to be getting on the content process side. We need to know why we're not getting it. So, this should cause us to. Are we broke? We haven't broken anywhere. Okay, good. We're still, we're still good. But that should cause us to break. Yeah, because we're going to serialize this information. I'm actually going to step into this value, into this method, serialized print data, because I believe the printer name actually gets serialized in here. So I'm going to step in there. And here we go. Um, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. Where do we print? Where do we do the name? Where do we do the name? Paper name, flex name, resolution name, print command, print to file, printer name, line, okay. So down here, line 209. So I'm going to break in MS print options implementation at line 208. We'll continue there. Okay, so here's the interesting part. We're going to get the printer name from the settings. And that's got what we want, PDF writer. And we're going to set it to the data. So data printer name now has PDF writer. So we it's got the information. We've, we've put it in the struct properly on the parent side. OK. Now on the child side. We're going to deserialize in the same way. Um, well, kind of the same, in, in the opposite way. Uh, so let's step in here, deserialize. And how do we get, where do we get the printer name? Printer name, printer name. Set printer name is on line 301. So break and as print. Options impl three hundred. So we'll continue. There we are. So what is in data printer name? Yeah. Should be PDF writer. Come on. Yep. Good. And then we're going to set it. Okay, so we properly set it. Huh. Huh. So what the dealio? Maybe I'm misremembering how print GTK print settings works. Maybe when we do that thing where we here, let me open up print settings GTK. And MS. So when we do this deserialization, after we deserialize all the default stuff, we do this thing where we we talked about this last week where we just get all this key value stuff and we overwrite a bunch of things. I wonder if doing that we accidentally blank out some things. So how does the printer name get stored? Um, get printer name. Ah, that's a problem. Shoot. Oh, 
Oops, I don't know. So uh, here's what I'm worried about. Um, we've been getting the printer at the very end. That's something that I was asked to do in my review feedback. But the printer name is what we were using at the very end to. Huh. How did this ever work? Because it's dependent on the GTK printer in order to get the name. Dependent on an MGTK printer in order to get the name. It gets the printer from the print settings, the actual GTK printer, which we don't have. We blank, like. Because we've created a new one. We've created a new one here. That's why. That's why it's not working. We created a new GTK print settings here. And so the GTK print settings doesn't have any kind of printer name. And you can't just set the name of the printer. You have to set the printer itself. But we don't do that till the very end. And we do that based on information on what the printer name is. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg problem. It's always... How come it's always a chicken and egg problem? I don't know. This is still building. So how are we going to solve this? To get the printer name, we have to have a GTK printer, apparently. To set the printer name, how does that even work? See if it starts with cups. And if we see cups on the front, we strip it off. And then we get the old printer name. It's not old printer name, or the old printer name does not equal the new printer name. This is made from printer false, and this is made from false false. And then we set the printer to GTK printer dot get set printer. And then we just pass it a string? Wait a second, how does that work? Print settings, GTK print settings. Set printer. You can just pass in the name of a printer? Is it that easy? Serialized print settings, data to settings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I think that's just a string value. I don't think you can actually like what I'm what I'm thinking about. Here's what I'm humming and hawing about. I'm hoping that it's just, just you. A lot of work was done to enumerate all the printers because we we weren't able to actually like get a printer by a name. I'm pretty certain you can't just set the printer name and have everything just work. You have to actually set the printer. Reasonably certain. That'd be get printer set printer. GTK print settings, GTK printer. Maybe that's all you need to do. Maybe you just set the printer, and then the, then how do we get the 
GTK printer for me. GTK printer. You can't. Ah, that's the problem. In order to get the printer, you do have to enumerate all. Okay, so good. Uh, I'm not going crazy. You actually do have to enumerate the printers to find the ones that match the name that you're looking for. Okay. So the problem here is that the settings that we're deserializing to, it's all getting wiped out. It's all getting wiped out. Okay. And why did Carl need to use a new Some new GTK print settings. Let's read his review feedback again. And that's part of that sort of fresh together, screwed up review, uh, Moz review uh, thing that happens. So that actually, his review feedback is over here. Or to use GTK print settings new and call set GTK print settings. So that's why I suggested it here. So maybe what I have to do is not just create the new GTK print settings here. Here, then what about this uh, settings thing that gets passed and deserialized to print settings? What do we do about that? Oh, hold on. Oh, of course, of course, of course. Deserialize. No, it doesn't make any sense. All right, I'll try and explain my confusion in a second. We need to take a look at how we call deserialize the print settings in the child process. So in the content process, we were passed to print settings, and then we send that up to the parent, serialized. In that same print settings object, we deserialize to it, so we reuse it. We basically just rewrite all of the changes to the same print settings item. The print settings wraps in GTK print settings, and it's over here. So what I'm thinking maybe we should do then is create the new GTK print settings and set it up here. Then the deserialization to it should write to the new GTK print settings, so we'll get the printer name. This is going to go away eventually. This makes sense, I believe. And then we unwrap it. I think this will work. Let's see if that works. So, detach. Detach. Quit. No. I 
it's 224. Um, I want to make sure that what I've just found will work, like this this change. I'm gonna make sure that works. I do want to review that patch, so I'm going to go a little long. I think. Hope that's cool. Um, and then you can see me review at least part of the patch. Uh, yeah, this thing. Um, I always hit this assertion. And you probably will too. If you have a debug build on, on Linux and you open the print dialog, you will assert when you quit, probably. Um, that's something we investigated a couple of weeks back, and it turns out it's not a big deal. Um, that's not even something we control. It's something in Cairo. So, going to build. And that was under embedding. I think that was where the change was. No, it wasn't. It was under widget GTK. How are we doing up here in the parent? Jeez. So I don't think I, I need to be able to build and test the patch like by hand in order to give it a like that's how I normally review a patch is not only will I read the patch and inspect it, I'll also kind of kick the tires a little bit. And I, so I can't give an R plus unless I uh, uh, unless I'm able to build it. And something's wrong here. So this GTK it was not declared in the scope, so I screwed up. Uh, saying this GTK is up here. Again, I'm not confident that I'm going to be done building this. Normally building on Linux is, uh, sorry, on OS X is actually pretty blazing fast. Um, but this might not be done for a little while. Let's we'll see. But I can inspect the patch. We can, you can watch me inspect the patch and, and check it out there. So let me get that ready. that spinner. Giant spinner of doom. Linking. Okay, let's get all this ready. I like to look at file changes. And that's, I wish I also, you know what I really wish I had? Just a little progress guide to let me know how far along I am in the build. Just to give me so I have an estimate. I used to be able to tell. Like, I'd, I'd be able to look at the build process and say, like, oh, I'm in, um, graphics, so it's going to probably take me another X minutes um, to build. I don't seem to be able to do that anymore. It used to be the case, anyways. I know that whenever you hit this point, the linking stage, that, I mean, clearly you're near the end. Usually that means you've got about two minutes left until you can run the executable. So let's see what uh, Moz Ian was working on here. So just to uh, refresh my memory and, and to get you familiarized with what the bug is about, Whenever you right-click on, on a link in an ETS, a remote tab, a remote browser, and you say, like, open link in new tab, um, we were causing an unsafe Kapow usage warning because we were synchronously reading the document URI object in the parent process, it looks like, uh, for the refer, and that causes a Kapow warning. We're also, yeah, we were mucking about getting like synchronously reading the document, the content document, doing things with it. And so we should move all of that processing down to the content process. Yeah, like we were trying to figure out whether or not the link node has the no refer, like the rel equals no refer on it, and stuff like that. And that's all going to cause unsafe kapows if you're in the parent process. So. Um, Ian's work is to move all that processing into the content process and uh, and then just send a message up once the context menu is ready to open with the results. So he changed two things. He changed the test. He had to fix a test to account for this change. And that's because this test was doing this like init context menu thing to shortcut 
it was like simulating opening up the context menu without actually doing it. But in order for the ETNS stuff to work, we actually do have to open up the context menu. So he actually does open it now. Like he sends the context menu event. He clicks on the command in the context menu and then he hides the, the context menu pop-up. I'm a little wary. My experience with pop-ups and automated tests is that they can go horribly wrong or you you wait for them to show up and they they don't show up in the right time, like it's all weirdly asynchronous and stuff. And sometimes things don't happen in the right order. So that's something to worry about, is maybe it's possible this might cause test oranges. So that's the thing to consider. But otherwise, it looks like what he's doing is straightforward. Like, you take, what, a node that you're going to, the command basically, Wait, how does this work? The first argument is a node. The node is what you will send the context menu command on. So essentially, the first argument to do context command will be what gets right-clicked. You're simulating right-click on. Okay, and in this case, it's like the document body, which is fine. And then you get the second argument is this ID for a command element in the context menu that you click. So and then you hide the pop-up. So the, in essence, what this does is it right-clicks the body and then it clicks on context show only this frame. Okay. That makes sense. And so we just have to make sure that, that we're maintaining this stuff. So I like to make sure that these IDs exist. UBG image, yeah, it's back to so much. UBG image and context UBG image, that's right. Context view image. It is passed to command. View media. View media, view image, that is right. Let's click on the image. Here, on the body. And show only this frame, context show only this frame, that's probably right. Show only this frame. Show only this frame, that's right. So that looks all right. Now it's what I like to do after that is check, think about the stuff that I don't see in this diff. So are there other things in this file that needed to be updated that I have not seen, that are not visible in this diff? So let's take a look. This test. So are there other things that like we call init context menu on that we should be converting to this? So he's changed three instances. Are there other instances? One, two, three. One, two, three. So he's got them all. I think that's okay. One, two, three. That's it. Okay. That's pretty good. Then this to me makes sense. Uh, I'm happy with this. I'm going to give this an plus. Um, I hesitate just now. I wonder if this might need some documentation just to say what it does. Uh, I'm not too fussy about that. I mean, it didn't even it didn't start with documentation. Maybe I'm only saying that because people are watching me right now. I'm gonna say don't bother. Let's just get this thing loaded. This looks good. Publish. And then there's the other patch, which is the little, uh, this is the one that actually fixes the unsafe compile stuff. We'll get to that in a second. My build was successful here. Let's test whether or not printing works again. And if it does, then I will put printing on a hold. We'll finish the review on that patch, and then I'm going to call it a day with my stream. Come on, man. There we go. Ooh, good 
Gray means locked up. What is going on? Okay, just slow. I wonder if that means we're linking in here. Really? No, but we're... Where are we? Hard to say. Okay, so let's try printing a thing. So slow. React to me. What's the deal with this guy? It's probably just because I'm swapping like crazy and doing a build on the parent and the story of my host machine. I'm probably, yeah, I'm swapping pretty hard. I can tell because of this kernel task thing. Uh, I'm doing some big ass swapping, crash point. Right OBS is taking a bit of memory. Whatever. Okay, so. If my theory was right, then this should print properly. I'm actually gonna make this a portrait. Make sure that works. Okay, so if my theory is right, then we should see a print job show up here. Yeah, we got it. Okay, that's what I like to see. So. Um, I'm not entirely sure my solution is clean, like I might want to clean up my patch a little bit, but my theory was right. Let me just write down what I discovered so that I don't forget for next time, I have a record of it. The problem was that I was, uh, that the printer name was getting wiped out since we rely on the MGTK print settings inside MSI print settings to hold on to the printer name. There was a chicken and egg problem where uh, so it's it's a chicken and egg problem where we need the printer name to get is it a printer name? It's not a chicken and egg problem. It's not a chicken and egg problem. I thought you needed the GTK printer in order to get the name, but you don't. You just need the GTK print setting, so I'm wrong on that. Um, we, after deserializing, we should learn to spell a bunch of stuff in the, uh, in NS print options GTK deserialize to print settings. I was chucking out the GTK print settings inside NSI print settings and replacing it with one that just had the GTK specific settings set. It's really not clear English. But basically that it's it's true. So uh, the solution was to uh, create the new GTK print settings. I think it's G capital G lowercase T and K for when I'm referring to GTK print settings. Create the new GTK print settings before uh, and set it on the NSI print settings before attempting to deserialize the print data from the parent. That way, we can properly get the printer name and enumerate, find the target. Good, so I'm going to put a halt here on the uh, printing stuff. We're going to, it might actually help my build time if I shut this VM down, so I'm going to do that. I'm just going to suspend it, and that might free up a bunch of memory and I can build faster. Hey, actually, we might be getting close to the end here. Uh, 
seeing things like tests. Yeah, you know, it's really hard to say because it's all done in a parallelized. Like it used to be very linear, but now we we build in like parallel. So I've lost the idea of, and that's great. That normally that will um, speed a lot of things up. I'm using all my cores to build, but the old advantage of knowing where I was in the build process is just gone. I have no idea where I am now. It's because it's all happening at the same time. A whole bunch of things. Okay, so while we're waiting for that to finish building, let's examine Mozian's patch and how it works. So we're inside the content process, inside what function? Handle content context menu. So this is fired whenever you right click on something. It's fired in the content process before the context menu even shows up. We're basically pre-populating this object with in useful information that the parent process might need to show the context menu. Then we send an event up to the parent, and then the parent shows the context menu. Um, and this code is used in both the e like the multi-process and single-process case. So what he's doing here is he creates a shortcut. Um, he sees the context menu uh, event. We get the owner document, the location, character set, and the base URI, and refer. Then he's getting the principal. That's just a shortcut. That's fine. And then what does he set? He sets edit flags, spell info, custom menu items, add on info, principal, and he adds more. He adds doc location, char set, base URI, and refer, which are all the things he put up here. The reason he puts them up in here, though, is because he also refers to them down here. So that makes sense. Uh, like I, Originally, I was going to suggest, like, why are these all the way up here? Why don't you put them in here? But he needs them in this other block as well, because this is the single process case. If we're not um, in the multi-process case, we can just attach to this G context menu content data directly. Pass that up. Document URI object. This is char set refer. OK. So that looks good. That makes sense to me. He's making it so that NS context menu has this notion of whether or not a link has no refer. That's good. For LM. That LM, what is LM? So in the multi-process case, LM is going to be probably a Kapow, and this is probably going to cause unsafe Kapow usage, maybe? That's worth looking at. So, yeah, I have some notes. The addition of does it run in process case? I use unsafe. Okay. This is a helper function that has gotten rid of the doc. So you can just read it directly from G context and content data, that's fine. Doesn't need that anymore. And then get parameters, no extra. Oh, that's good. Yeah, doesn't need that. That's cool. Doesn't need that either. Great. Doesn't need that. For URI, it's a docket URI object. Just allowing its content. Let's just change this from a bar to a let, which I don't mind. Sure. Let's put a new dog here. Get rid of the dog here. So you don't need it there. Yep, yep, yep. It's all the same. 
This is all using unsafe compile here because owner document would be a compile. And so it all compiles unsafe compile, so that's good. We get it directly from the compile and content data. For the application then you're with location.graph. So doc location to make sure Sure. Tab char set. Okay, I assume he's on that, right? For you are. Okay, that looks good. URL security checks. So it's part of the doc. It's part of the frame URL. Instead, we use. Doc location and go over here, location current. Good. That looks good. This makes sense. Okay. And here in tab browser, we then Whenever the context menu is open in the child process, it sends a message up to the parent whenever it's finally ready. And that's what we populate the G context menu content data object with in the multiprocess case. So document UI object it creates a URI. And what does it do with that document URI object? Okay. 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 Sense. So data doc location char set data CRI. And that's the stuff he had set earlier. Application char set char set base URI. Char set. Where's base URI? Where's base URI? Huh? We sent Doc location, char set, base URI, and refer here. And custom add info principle, doc location, char set, base URI, and refer. Where's the base URI right in the single process case? Yeah, buddy? Yeah? She here? Base URI. I guess he doesn't. Oh, he doesn't need it. He doesn't need it up here. So that I'm a little weird about. I think. Is remote true? Am I weird about that? How do I feel about that? Is remote false? I think I want the, the information being passed up to be uniform. So I prefer if the information passed to G context menu content. Good, our build's done. Content data be uniform regardless of whether or not it's single or multi process. Can you please pass the base URI as well? I know he doesn't use it. Um, I, know I, mention it. I know we don't end up using it in the single process case, but I think uniformity, consistency makes sense here. I like uniformity. I like consistency. Okay. And then this last bit. That's where he uses it. It's where You know what? No, I'm wrong. He doesn't actually set base URI here. Okay. You know what? I'm wrong. I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of this. This doesn't make any sense. Um, okay. So I'm actually happy with this because he doesn't use base URI in here. I thought maybe base URI was being included here. But 
it's not. It's just being used to construct the document URI object on the parent side. So great. I'm actually pretty happy with this. So what is it that I want to check? The addition, does it run in the multiprocess case? Link has no refer, right, no longer. This thing, it has context menu.js. Let's take a look at it. So dot link protocol equals this, this. So we initialize the Link has no refer equals that. What makes use of the link has no refer? That I'm worried about. So where is it doing that? On saveable link. If is on link, then we do all this stuff. So can't we also set this in G? Uh, this is also going to cause this is going to cause an unsafe cacao usage when we attempt to I think it will. Let me just quickly look at the definition of this function. Link is no refer. Yeah, I mean, it's going to get attributes on it, it's going to manipulate it, it's going to read values. Uh, when we attempt to determine if we have rel equals no refer, double quotes on this node. Can't we compute this in the content process like we've been doing, like we do, doing for the other values, like the document URL, etc. That's really my only issue with this. So, um, the other thing, I do like to make sure that. I mentioned this before, stuff that has changed is obvious, but stuff that has not changed and is not in the diff is less obvious, and that's the hard, like, that's the stuff that's invisible in a review that I like to think about. It's the stuff that I cannot see in the diff, and that's the other stuff that might rely on this code. So are there other usages of open link and parameters that are still passing in a doc as the first argument? File is this and it's context menu. So how many usages do we have? One, an open link, and that's updated here. Yep. We have another one in open link in private window, which he has updated. Another one in open link in tab. Okay, that's been updated. Over here, open link in current. Yep. And that's it. So he got them all. Good. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got them all. I think it should be good to go. So let's try it out. And let's also confirm my hypothesis that this is going to cause unsafe capacity usage. So uh, did I just build with? Yeah, I just build normally. So. So I'm actually I'm going to going to um, I've got this add-on called uh, PKE meter that I created that plays a sound every time I have an unsafe kapow usage warning. Uh, I'm going to actually add a source to OBS for audio output. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. So I'm capturing my audio output now. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. If not. Um, We'll see. So here's a page. I'm going to close this. Hopefully it's not too loud. I don't know if you 
got that. Uh, I'm going to do it again. Mm, probably you didn't get it. But just looking at the little audio level on my output capture, I don't think you got it. Um, maybe if I type my output to Soundflower. Yeah. And then audio output capture settings. Get Soundflower. Okay, so if I close this now, you should hear some clicks. Right, that may have been really loud. Hopefully it wasn't too loud. Um, um, so I just play a couple of clicks every time I have an unsafe Kapow usage warning, um, and that way I know without having to look at my log the whole time. And now I want to test Moz Ian's patch to see if I still hear unsafe Kapow usage warnings. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, test page, let's say R off, and will this, I don't think I heard anything there, yeah, that's good, and uh, I'm not hearing any clicks there either, no clicks there, that's all good. Um, there was another one as well, which was open, what is it, open link in frame, open link in, open frame in tab, so if I have a subframe, uh, let's take a look, frame, let's see an example of one. So these are frames apparently. So if I right click, I right click this frame, open frame in new tab. I didn't hear any clicks there. This frame, open frame in new window. No clicks there. So maybe I'm wrong about. So maybe I'm wrong about this. So maybe I should turn this into a question. Is this going to pause on safe comparison from having more in this mode? If not, why not? So can we okay. I'm actually pretty happy with this patch. Um, I think I'm going to R equals me with uh, satisfactory answer to my question below. Boom. Done. <sighs> hey, all right. And I had need info of myself on this to remind myself to actually, like, Review it because I need more stuff on my uh, on my dashboard, and so I can clear that need info. Done. So now I've only got eight things on my dashboard that need desperately need my attention. That's good. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go back to my nope, not this way, board, my website, and turn this off. The output capture off. Okay, so I'm actually going to wrap it up here. So let's see how far we got. Um, did that. Did this. Talked about this. The tree, did it ever open? It did not, so I can't land my uh, other stuff just yet. Figured out this. We figured out how printing got busted. Whoop. Oh, I just crossed that off. I uh, didn't get to addressing more of Carl's feedback. I'll do that after this meeting, meeting after this uh, stream, and then uh, post a patch up for review probably today. I reviewed a patch, and I didn't get to this one, but maybe that's what we'll do next week. We'll see. So uh, thank you so much for watching episode four. I know we went a bit long. This was two hours. That was uh, longer than I normally do it, but I really appreciate you hanging around and watching, uh, and we'll do this again 
next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, so thanks again. Take care and happy acting.